Hello, everyone. This is Jack Bosch speaking with the Forever Cash Real Estate Podcast. I'm excited to have you watching or listening another episode, whether you listen to it on iTunes or you watch us on YouTube under the profile of uh, uh, Land Profit Generator. You can find us there. I'm super excited. You can look for Jack Bosch and you find us there too. My guest today is our CPA and good friend, Warren Tarl uh, from TA. How do you say that, that the company? I only call you Uncle Warren. So just... <laughs> Tarl Accounting. Tarl Accounting. Wonderful. You just recently changed your name, so I was a little hesitant. But uh, uh, Warren has been our CPA for like 17 years, um, and he has done just an absolutely stellar job. And, uh, and now he's also the CPA of a lot of our land flipping students and a lot of our real estate students and our syndication investors and so on and so forth. So we'll get started right now. We're going to talk about, uh, about tax law. We're going to about how to save taxes. We're going to talk about uh, the biggest mistakes people make when they come to him. We're going to be right back after this. Welcome to the Forever Cash Life Real Estate Investing Podcast with your hosts, Jack and Michelle Bosch. Together, let's uncover the secrets to building true wealth through real estate and living a purpose-driven life. We are back online right now. So first of all, welcome, Warren. I'm um, excited to have you here. Thanks, this is awesome. A nice studio. <laughs> okay, Warren and I know each other for many years. He's making fun of the mess in the background of my office here. So, uh, but uh, I actually like very much what you have in the background there. You have the land profit formula over there, which is our very first uh, over there. Yes, which is our very first land course when it still was an audio CD course back in two thousand and eight, I think. Anyway, so uh, we have been to, together kind of like we're helping each other and, and he helping us more on the tax side for every year. So he's also a member of our Ultimate Boardroom Mastermind, uh, Real Estate Mastermind. And well, Warren, tell us a few words quickly about uh, like your background. Uh, how long have you been a CPA? How did you get to be a CPA? And, and when did you, what, and when and how did, uh, let's start with that first. <laughs> okay. Well, see, being an accountant is actually a second career for me. I don't even know if you knew that, Jack. I but, don't. So I started off in electrical engineering and I, <laughs> well, I won't get into all that, but I worked for a, a pretty high tech alarm company where we were putting in uh, smoke detection systems in military bases. And, and uh, <laughs> my mom thought for sure I was secretly working for the CIA because I had to get background checks and she thought it was just a cover job because of all the places I was going. But, well, was it? Maybe it was. We will never find out probably. That says, as my mom said, well, if you did, you wouldn't tell me, right? I'm like, <laughs> how do you win that question? But anyway, I've been working in, uh, just moved out of that, went to work for our family business in St. Louis. So I left California to go to St. Louis to work in our family business. and. My grandfather, among other things, uh, was a real estate guy. Mm -hmm. And he started furniture stores, uh, some pictures of my family back there. But I can never figure out which way to go on these cameras. But uh, he, he started these furniture stores. And, and I'll tell you this one philosophy, because this is my philosophy. And it's yours, which is so weird. That's why we're friends, right? Because you know, in, in, in your book, it's exactly forever cash. It's exactly that, right? My grandfather taught me when I was working for him and it's just in his philosophy always that a business is a temporary thing because even a good business, there could be one change in law, change in technology, change in people's taste and a good business goes out of business. So to him, the purpose of having a business was to generate excess cash that can be used to invest in things that are permanent. And to him, permanent was real estate. And so he had his furniture stores and he took those money from the furniture stores and developed shopping centers to put them in. And now, you know, one too many recessions and internet sales and things like that, too many. The furniture stores are all long gone. The shopping centers are there, my family. Not me yet, but most of my family still lives off of those. And if they don't have too much fun, maybe it'll be something left for me someday. But uh, so. Right. So, so I went and started working for my grandfather in St. Louis, learned about the importance of real estate, learned about that philosophy. But I also saw how important good 
tax and accounting advice was, and I also saw how difficult it was to get and discovered I had a little bit of a knack for that sort of thing. And so I went back to school, got, a, got my bachelor's degree in accounting, then I got a master's degree in taxation, and I was about to go back and go to night school to be a lawyer to learn, to learn law. And that's when Diana, my wife, decided, you know what, you've been going to school our entire married life. If you want to go to law school, go for it, but you're going to be single. So I decided, nah, I think I'll just stick with being an accountant then. All right, and that worked out quite well for you. It did, it was amazing. And because of my real estate background, wherever I worked, they would give me the real estate clients. Because mm -hmm. uh, I was surprised when I got out of school. So when I took my master's degree, I focused really heavily on real estate stuff. Because it was our family business, right? It was for my own protection or my own well-being. And uh, so we focused on, on the real estate stuff. And so when I got out of school, I was surprised to see that so many accountants didn't really get real estate and I right. did. So I would get those clients wherever the firms I worked for, which also so happened to be their best clients. Right. And exactly. Because they have real estate is profitable. So there's like more revenue coming through it, more complexities, which obviously brings more revenue for the CPA firm. Right. For the and they're, and they're the wealthier clients. And this is what I didn't know back then. I couldn't figure out which came first. Right. I didn't know, I, I knew one thing, I knew wealthy people had real estate. What I didn't know was, did the real estate make them wealthy or because they're wealthy, they had real estate. And after all these years, I figured out that it's both. <laughs> and that's true, right? The wealthy people put money in real estate and a lot of people have built wealth through real estate. That's beautiful. So then, uh, so you got into taxation, you got a real estate expert, and I can, I can, uh, I can agree with you very much so um, that we got lucky that we found you early on because the way we found Warren was that we read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, right? And actually back then, Michelle, my wife and business partner, she uh, was, was doing her master's uh, at uh, Thunderbird, the global school for, 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 for international management here in Phoenix. That what we made, that's why we moved down to Phoenix. And, uh, and, and there was a guy by the name of Robert Kiyosaki who came in and taught uh, and actually hired a few of the students very early on before his book was even known uh, to, uh, to help, him, help him develop a marketing plan to go out there and, and, and become a brand. And one of these guys was in a a study group with Michelle and one evening we go over there and this guy says like, I, I, we met this guy, we hired us and he wrote this book. You, should, you need to read this book. And this was 1999 and I read the book and it changed my entire outlook on things. So logically when we started our business in 2002 and then in 2003, we did a few deals. And then after doing those few deals, we went back we said, okay, now we made some money, let's incorporate, let's create a, a tax and liability optimized structure. And, but we, of course, don't know where to go. So what's the logical thing? We love the Robert Kiyosaki thing. So we went to his, uh, to his CPA, recommended CPA firm. And who we did we meet there, working there, was Mr. Warren Tarl, right? So Warren, tell us about that and how, we, how you from there separated and started your own business. Okay. Well, it was really interesting. So I was in St. Louis and I decided it was time to move. And so we chose, <laughs> actually, I wanted to move to the East Coast. I really love the, uh, the uh, uh, Chesapeake Bay Area and all the history there. And I thought it was very sophisticated and I just sort of liked it there. And I had some clients when I was working in St. Louis that were there, so I got to go there. And I told Diana, we're gonna move, let's move to like Delaware or to uh, Maryland. And, and so I was like, well, let's go to Maryland. I really like Maryland. Baltimore just seems like such a cool place and we're right in the heart of everything. And Diana said, I don't like the cold. I don't want to go there. If we're going to move anywhere, let's go to Arizona. And I said, no, we're going, we're going to Baltimore. I'm the man. So I put my foot down and here we are in Arizona. There you go. That, that worked out real well. It did. Uh, and, it, and that changed my whole life because, so I got a job working here in Arizona and I won't put this company down because they did hire me. Right. But they, they, they hired me. And again, just like at other places I had worked, I got their biggest client because he was a real estate guy and he was doing a ton of things. I mean, some of the things I didn't even realize, realize were really real estate related. Like he had Indian gaming casinos, which if you really think about it is a real estate play when you see how it works. 
right. and he had hotels. He had all these things put together. His tax structure was entirely wrong. He was paying you know, way too much in taxes. And this was, this was what, 1990, late 90, or 2000, 90, late 90s. And he was paying just way too much in taxes. And because the structure was all wrong. I mean, here's how much, you know, you, a lot of us complain about our making our quarterly estimated taxes. His quarterly estimated taxes were over a million dollars a quarter. Wow. Like I was paying a bunch of taxes. And I did, no, I didn't spend a lot of time. I just did a little bit of playing with it because I just, you know, graduated out of my master's in tax and all that stuff. And like, so I went to my boss. I did the tax returns like I was told and I brought them to my boss and I said, here, look, if we make these changes, we can save them a lot of money. And this is without even thinking a lot about it. This was just really quickly. I'm sure there's even more we can find for him. And I'll never forget this because it changed my whole life. And I hope that he was sitting kind of like this, you know, at his desk. And I kind of put the paper in front of him. He looks up to me. He goes, you know, pushes the glasses up and looks at me. He goes, Warren, we're paid to think or we're paid to do the tax returns, not to think. Wow. And that is unfortunately the philosophy out there for a lot of people, especially the, the tax accountants that do uh, say, and that's why uh, we very quickly realized, we didn't know that story, but we very quickly realized that the one person that actually had the more creativity that was answering our questions in a better way, that was just, wasn't just pushing us off. And we were dealing with a main partner over there, the person that was even wrote a book with Kiyosaki and, uh, and, and, and the, we realized Warren was smarter than the other guy. So we're like, you know what? And all of a sudden we hear Warren has quit. I was like, no, we, where is this? So we tracked him down. We followed him. He was not allowed to obviously solicit. Neither did he. Not a single thing. We followed him. It was like, Warren, uh, help us. So I think we stayed another while with the other one for one more tax return. But then we came over to Warren and Warren started his own company that is now thriving and has uh, and a lot of our students in there. And even, even like to, to reconfirm that, I one of our good friends who does a lot of turnkey house flips every year, like six to 800 or so turnkey house flips, uh, he was like, once I introduced him to Warren and Warren looked at his numbers, they were able to amend their tax returns for several years and literally save him six, save him six figures in tax returns uh, to six figures in taxes that he had overpaid the IRS just because his former accountant was not paid to think he was only paid to do a CPAs. Uh, to, to your results may returns. vary. Pardon? Your results may vary. Your results may, of course, your results may vary. Of course, of course. If you are with a good tax CPA, then great. You may, your results may look good. But, uh, but that, Greg, like, he confirmed it for us. Also, between the years, there was like some, we have, we, 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 our business grew and we were just not sure exactly if, if we're still in the right path. So we, we with, uh, with Warren's help, we went uh, to another guy that is like very well known, a tax attorney, very creative guy. He confirmed our structure and he says like, no, what Warren has created was absolutely perfect for you guys. So we got this confirmed many times and, uh, and we just love it to have somebody at, at our side that does really good things. So now, Warren, let me ask you, let's dive in a couple of things. When okay. you have a customer uh, come to you, let's say two kinds of customers, one that's just starting out and has done a few things and one that's already or has not done many, many things and one that's very experienced already, what is the number one mistake that student that people come to you when they, when they want to set up, uh, when they come to you and they uh, inquire about your services, when you look at their stuff? You know, it, it's... The number one thing that's wrong is people trying to do it themselves. Uh, I find that often because you'll you, people will listen and they'll get tax advice. Even right now, we might give out some tax advice. Now, don't take my word for it. Listen, you know, look it up, do whatever. But one one piece of warning is don't ever take tax advice from somebody who's not willing to prepare your return and sign it, because if I if I tell you something wrong and then I prepare your return that way and I we, and we send it off and I have to sign it as the preparer. If the IRS comes back and says, that was wrong, you, you know, totally, you shouldn't have done that. I have preparer penalties that I would have to pay. And they're probably even worse than the penalties you might have to pay on your return. So there's a lot of advice out there. And so we hear some really crazy things when people come in the door from, you know, that maybe heard it on a podcast, maybe heard it from a stage or read it in a book somewhere. None of these guys are going to prepare their tax return so they can say whatever they want to. And it's up to you to figure out what the right answer is. So number one thing is people trying it on their own. And 
I don't care. Even if you're really small and you say, I'm just going to go get TurboTax on it or whatever, and I'm going to do this on my own because I don't want to spend the money to do it. Even, even just that time and the, the, the bandwidth of your brain that you're using up to keep doing things on your own and thinking through it is taking away from time where you're actually going to be making money. You don't make money when you're doing bookkeeping. You don't make money when you're doing taxes. You don't do money, make money when you're doing the, those things. You make money, at least for the people I think we're talking to, you make money when you're mostly marketing your business. Even the details of your business could be done by other people, but that marketing and selling of your business, that's, that's the heart of where you're making your money. Right. Uh, very cool. So, so that's, that's, I, I, I agree with that because I mean, I remember the first year I looked at doing my tax and I think the very first, as an employee, I still didn't do it, did do my taxes, but I had absolutely nothing uh, there. I mean, I had a W2 and I, that's it. All right. So I hadn't sold any shares, anything. So basically that was the 1040 easy and I was done. The moment we started doing some land deals, the moment we started flipping some properties, I mean, just the difference between a short-term flip and a long-term flip, like a short-term, uh, when you flip something right away and something we held, perhaps we bought and held, I don't know how to report this on the tax returns as a different thing at different tax rates and stuff like that. I mean, and then having to shift your mind into, into the world and the way of thinking to on these legal forums, I mean, it just gives me a headache thinking about it. I don't know how you do it, but I mean, you must love it, but uh, but but it's just not where I live, right? So, so you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't just because you save a bunch of money figure out how to, I don't know, roof your, how to put a new roof on your house, right? I mean, you wouldn't just go figure out there, and I can save, I can buy the materials and I can go out there and I can nail them on myself. You wouldn't do that. But yet a lot of people want to do their own taxes because they're not willing to spend the money that it takes to get them done. When exactly what Warren says, you could literally, you could use that time and do another deal and make that other deal, make another 10 grand. And now the taxes are many times very, very paid for. Well, that's great. Right. So now Warren, let's go ahead. I was going to say, then that, that would be, that would be number one. The second biggest problem is actually the opposite. So, and this is for people just starting mostly, right? So we'll get people just starting who will have set up, they will have spent the money, hired somebody that wasn't necessarily looking out for their best interest, but, but that other person's own best interest, and will buy, uh, will, will, will get a package of, uh, let's say, entities and a big structure set up that would be ideal for them probably four or five years down the road. But they haven't even bought their first piece of land or their first house yet. They're still looking, and they have five entities and a corporation and all this structure set up, <laughs> and and like, well, I can't buy any, I can't buy that piece of land because I just spend all my money setting up the entities. And besides, I don't have time to go looking and sending out the letters and doing the things I need to do because I'm trying to figure out what entity I'm supposed to do these things out of. I do tell this to a lot of people, and it's only halfway facetious, is when I say, you know, most important when you're starting out, create a tax problem, then come to me and I'll help you make it go away. But the most important thing you got to do is start. Jack, you said my favorite thing ever a long, long time ago. I still credit with you, credit you for this. And I don't know if you still use this, but it's my, my favorite model used to say, you know, anything worth doing is worth doing poorly. And I, that is so, so true. And, and maybe I should even replace my first biggest mistake with this one is get started. That's the most important thing. We'll figure out all the details later. That's very true. Uh, and yes, I do occasionally still use it, probably not as often as I've done in the past, but it's, it's very true because the first time I use it with my daughter all the time because she wants to do something. She's 11 years old and she's with Sophia, obviously. Uh, you know, her actually Warren's wife is actually the godmother of our daughter. That's how, uh, how close we are now. And, uh, and, we, um, and I use it with her all the time. She tries to do something for the first time and she, guess what? She sucks at it. She, she fails because there's not been a human in this world that has, has, uh, has done everything they ever do for the first time, done it perfectly. So, so I basically tell her, you know what, Sophia, this is cool. This is fine because everything worth doing is worth doing poorly 
at the beginning than I add. The first time you do something, you always suck at doing something, and that's normal. And then she's like, really? Really, Papa? Yeah, and that's like, yeah, so, so go. It's normal that you don't do it perfectly. So the next time you do it better, and the next time you do it better. So practice creates mastery. And then she's like, stops crying and stuff, and then she starts realizing, okay, this is normal, so there's no reason for me to cry, and, and she improves. And, and that works there very well, but it applies here very much too. So then um, let's switch gears for a moment and, uh, and then talk about the actual, uh, the big thing on the horizon, right? Well, not on the horizon, already implemented or being implemented right now is the Trump tax cuts uh, right. or tax changes, I want to say. So uh, can you give us just the quick highlights of what it affects us as a business owner or what is your favorite pieces about the, the, the tax, the new tax laws? Okay. So there's a lot. It, we, we actually love it. It's just given us so many more tools to use. Uh, so, you know, don't, I won't be political here with this, but you know, it just gives us so many options and so many tools to use with people that uh, it, we, we, it, it has made life more complicated for us. I'll say that. This has been one of our busiest. Wasn't uh, it the Simplification Act? Yeah, that's the funniest part about it. So yeah, none of us bought the simplification thing. That you know, it never is. Yeah, that just means the accountant full employment act. But uh, so here's one one example, right? Remember, and 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 you know, if you guys look me up on Facebook, you can see my Facebook pages. I we just did a really cool. I just that uh, was fun. A little Facebook live about the new tax form. So if you, especially if you've done your own tax returns, they've changed the 1040 for 2018. It's entirely different. You're not going to be able to find anything. Oh, your name's still in the same place, but that's about it. Uh, and so remember when they were talking about this thing, they made this big deal out of uh, being able to file your taxes on a postcard, mm -hmm. and which I, we all thought was nonsense, right? Because everybody electronically files, so who cares? <laughs> it's just right. a bunch of data. It doesn't really have to fit on anything. But they were driven, and they focus the IRS on making this new tax form the size of a postcard. So now the 1040, I, I wish I would have printed out a copy. Uh, the new 1040 is the size of a postcard, a rather large postcard, like a four by six, you know, half a sheet of paper, po size postcard, front and back. And that's okay. the form 1040. But you can't just file the 1040 because it needs some supporting documents or sheets that were never part of the return before. So now you have two half pages and six additional full full size pages that go along with it, and okay. and and that replaced the old 1040, which was two pages. So we replaced it with two pages, with six full pages and two half pages. And somebody said, "But Warren, I had my, I filed a 1040, and it was more than two pages because it had Schedule A, Schedule B, Schedule C, Schedule D, Schedule E." I don't think there's a G, but anyway, you know, there's all those alphabet soup forms that go with it. Well, those are all still required. You still have to file all those too, along with the six full pages and the two half pages. So that's how they simplified things. But anyway, so bringing it back to uh, bringing it back to like, what's one of your? What do you think about that? Uh, but but uh, the, how does what does it, how does it help? A typical, let's say, let's talk with a house flipper first. And then uh, because the land flippers, we really not help that much because land doesn't depreciate anyway. Mm -hmm. It's uh, there income, is. but there's some. Okay, let's go uh, ahead. Let's talk about it. How does it help like the typical person that wants to get into real estate, either house flipping or hopefully not house flipping, but land flipping? So the biggest thing that affects, and, and this is probably the most talked about, but still people don't know it. Uh, the biggest thing in the tax law for businesses is the 20% pass-through deduction. So they, you, we all heard you know, they, they lowered the corporate tax rate. So if you have a, a C corporation, you know, these big corporations out there, they now have a flat 21% tax bracket. And everybody was talking about that being a tax cut. <laughs> Some of our clients have C corporations. A lot of our clients have C corporations that are taxed at the 15% or used to be. So that was actually a tax increase. But they wanted to, they wanted to help businesses and it was like, well, you helped corporations, those big corporations with this 21% flat tax, but most businesses in America are pass-through entities. They're S corporations, they're sole proprietors, they're LLCs taxed as S corporations or sole proprietorships, or they're partnerships. These all pass through 
and you report taxes on your personal tax return. So how, what are you going to do to help them? So they gave us this 20% pastor deduction. There's a few hoops to jump through, but for the most part, whatever your profit from your business, whether it be land flipping, house flipping, uh, own a pizza parlor, whatever your business is, so long as it's a, a sole proprietorship or a, an S corporation or a partnership that passes through to your return, your own personal tax return, take the profit, all the other deductions, do all the work, the depreciation, all that stuff, look at your profit, then subtract 20%. So in other words, if you had $100,000 profit from your company, you're only going to pay taxes on $80,000. That's good. So that's turned out to be really huge for people. There are some income limitations. If your income is too high, they start to take away that 20% uh, and then they replace it with some other things. So it, 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 again, that was tax simplification, but that 20% is out there. And we saw that what that's has made one of the biggest differences for most people's businesses uh, that we've seen. So that's, we're really excited about that. There's not a whole lot. I mean, I wish I could take credit for this, but there's not a whole lot that we do that, you know, in our strategizing that makes it work. It just happens unless people are at higher income rates and then we have to strategize so they can take advantage of it. It does In your change. business, you, you deal with a lot of people who are very successful. And, uh, and, and so there's some more strategy necessary anyway. Uh, which makes it more important to pick a good good accountant. Uh, uh, some of these beginning, they probably still qualify for the full 20%. So that's really exciting. Right. Uh, now, personally, because as, as many people know, as, uh, we, we not only do land flips, but we also started buying apartment complexes. I'm personally very excited about the bonus depreciation rules that allow you now, if I'm correct, to depreciate, to do any, if you do a cost segregation study, uh, then it allows you to depreciate all the pieces that usually would depreciate over five, 10 or 15 years right away in year one of owning it. Right. And that obviously can make a huge impact on taxation. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. And so most of you, I assume, understand the whole concept of, de of depreciation. And basically the idea is to, if you have a, a, a asset that's going to last you many years, they want you to be able, you want you to spread the cost of that as, asset over the life, the expected lifetime of it to make it you know, somewhat fair, right? Uh, you know, you buy, a, you buy a rental house for $200,000 and you're going to rent it out for the next 10 years. You should spread out that $200,000 over that time period just to match the income. At least that's the thought behind it. So right. A few years ago, several years ago, they came up with this idea of bonus depreciation where they let you write off 50% of the cost if you buy something that would have a useful life of 15 years or less, but it also had to be brand new. And this worked in real estate. If you were buying new construction or doing rehab or something like that, and you were putting in new stuff, we could right new off stoves, refrigerators stuff like that refrigerators new cabinets new windows you know things like things such as this uh and and it also works in other businesses so we like to talk about it with real estate any kind of business that has things that they would depreciate works for it too so my you know your pizza parlor <laughs> like i must be hungry uh that, that works for that too but it had to be brand new. And the reason they created this rule was they were trying to stimulate the economy. Because remember, up until a few years ago, we were kind of chugging along and we had 9-11 and things. this came right after that. So they're looking for things to stimulate the economy. And so they created this for people to buy expensive stuff and help them do it. Well, with the new tax cut, they came, or the new tax law, they came in and said, we're gonna change those bonus depreciation rules. First of all, instead of only being able to deduct 50%, you're not going to be able to deduct 100%. Mm -hmm. And we're going to take away the requirement that it be new. So even if you buy used stuff, and the used thing doesn't really come into play for many people other than us real estate guys, right? When you're doing, now you don't have to buy new construction. You could buy an existing place. And, and so when you buy 
when you buy, uh, let's say a residential property, whether it be an apartment complex or a single family home or even a little condo unit, those are all residential, first of all. And that's where people get confused. So residential real estate for tax purposes, and this isn't the bank or anybody else, but for tax purposes, it's residential if people live there. It, if they don't live there, then it's commercial. So by even that definition, a 100 unit apartment complex is still considered residential for tax rules. So normally a residential property, we depreciate it over 27 and a half years. So you take the purchase price, you break out a little something for the land because even the government's not crazy enough to let us depreciate land. But take the purchase price, break out something for land, divide that by 27 and a half, and that's how much you get to deduct every year, as long as it's been 12 months. So every 12 months, you get to deduct that amount. But when you buy a, a, a property, a building, you really buy more than just the building itself. The building is what we get to depreciate over 27 and a half years, but there's also personal property inside that building. And that personal property, we can depreciate if it's inside a rental, over just five years. And, and so what's personal property? Personal property is basically defined as anything you can remove without causing damage. So it's gonna be things like oh, kitchen appliances, like you said, Jack, and cabinets and countertops and ceiling fans and window treatments and shelving and some kinds of flooring and all these kinds of things. Even though you might watch some of those rehab shows on TV, uh, I know my wife loves her HGTV stuff, and when they take out the cabinets and the countertops and all that, they take a sledgehammer and destroy them. You don't have to do that. They, the IRS, at least the IRS thinks you can just remove them without damaging them. So they are considered personal property. We can depreciate those over five years, which means they qualify for bonus depreciation. Also, there's things on the outside of your building. There's gonna be driveways and sidewalks irrigation, landscaping, walls, fences, pretty much everything that you've done to the outside, those are considered land improvements and land improvements can be depreciated over just 15 years. So that still qualifies for the bonus depreciation. So you could, and, and bonus depreciation is an election. You could choose to do it or choose not to. And some people for some reasons decide they'd rather have five and 15 year depreciation than taking it all at once and that just part of strategizing. But yeah, that's. So the beauty of that is that now with the, with the new tax law, if you buy a property, uh, a improved property in like December 31st of, of a year, you can literally still do the, use all the depreciation in that year. Now yeah. that's extremely important for particularly high income earning people because high income earning people can now either become a partner in such, a, in such an investment, they invest some money, perhaps become a partner in one of these apartment complexes in these investments, and then get a big part of, a good part of that depreciation, or they can find their own deal uh, and, and buy them themselves, uh, or even passive investors, and like in our deals, our passive investors also get a portion of that depreciation. So literally right now, we bought a property on December 19th, 2018, and uh, we did the cost segregation study, which is a study where they actually go through and an independent company goes and, and, and catalogs basically what is all there and what is the value of that. So they, they break out piece of the part of for the land, they catalog what's the, pro what's the rest of it, how much of that is that five and 15 year kind of property. And then they give you a report and they're, if the IRS ever comes and says, no, no, we challenge it, they're helping you defend that against that because it wasn't me coming up with some crazy numbers. It was them as an independent party, you pay them a little bit money, but it's not even that expensive to do that. And all of a sudden you get a big, very big depreciation. So all our investors that invested with us uh, right at the beginning on that deal, they're getting a very good uh, depreciation right from the get-go that literally will wipe out their, their, their income on the property for really several, several years. They can even, uh, whether they don't use one year, you understand you can roll over to the right. other years, right? Right, and, and, and that's what is, and we won't get into all that because it starts getting complicated and all the passive loss rules, like it's not here, but you know, 
in, in theory, the way depreciation works, and I use this example a lot with a lot of people, I say, let's say you had a property that cash flows, positive cash flow of $5,000 a year, just to make up a number. And let's say the depreciation is $8,000 a year. Right. That means for tax purposes, you have a $3,000 loss, even though you put $5,000 in your bank. Now, whether or not you can use that extra $3,000 loss is going to depend on a few things. And so some people look at it and say, well, if, if they don't qualify to be able to use that $3,000 loss, they look at this whole thing as negative. So, but you're forgetting that you put $5,000 in the bank that you're not going to pay taxes on. Right. And so, the other part is you couldn't you use the $3,000 and apply it to next year? Right. And the $3,000, we'll look and see if we can use it next year. It rolls forward indefinitely until, and here's the key point, until you sell the property. When the property sells, that loss that's been accumulating, if you haven't been able to use it, be, frees up that year and you could use it that year. So it's a time, it's just a matter of timing. It's not necessarily, it's not, it's not if, it's when. And I love that. I mean, this is exactly the kind of thing that you want to discuss with your, with your CPA as your complexity of your business grows. If you're a beginning investor, and we'll wrap up right now, but if you're a beginning investor that just basically has like done a few flips, well, there's ways that you can even save some taxes through certain structures, uh, save some of the uh, self-employment tax and things like that. But you got to have the right structure in place then. Uh, having said that, I always have a second saying that Michelle and I always say, and that is faster is better than perfect. So I was in, we always a favor of like, we get that question all, all day long, and perhaps you can chime in on that. Uh, I, like if somebody says, well, do I set up my structure first or do I wait until this is all set up before I start getting my first deal? What do you tell them? Yes. <laughs> but yeah, get, we, what, what I, what I, yeah, you should get the structure set up, but it should be a structure that grows with you, right? You, you know, a, a lot of people, I know, Jack, you, you're very generous and, and, and are very transparent, and you share with people your structure of how you've done, set up the business. Doesn't mean you need Jack's structure day one. Jack's, right. as you can tell, has done a few probably more transactions than someone who's just starting. So... You're going to grow. You're going more. to be back yeah. someday, but you're not going to start there. So, so yes, we'll get the entity set up. But what I don't want to have happen is you to, is people to use that as an excuse not to start. Exactly. So yeah. there's, there's people who, who they, I had a mentor used to, she used to say, you know, people plan to plan to plan to plan and they never do it. Exactly right. So that's why it's like faster is better than perfect. Just get started. And when you see the first deal is starting to happen, go set up the stuff. Setting up a legal entity structure doesn't take forever. So literally by the time that you have a deal under contract, by the time you sell it, by the time you have your first profit, you can have that set up. You can do it ideally in parallel uh, while you get started and so on. But, but, but the most important thing is consult with a good CPA because as you, as you do more things, there's so many different things that you can think of or that your CPA, if it's a good one, uh, like, uh, can think of and to, to optimize your structure and to add additional pieces to it that, that will allow you to keep your tax your tax rates legally, 100% legally and 100% above board. We're not, uh, we're not doing anything shady here. You can keep your tax rate way below what most other people do it. Like we have, we brought on one person uh, a year ago that had a, uh, that had a W-2 job where he made a very good income for, for many years. And he couldn't believe the different options that are not available to him as a W-2 income owner that are now available to him uh, as a self-employed person uh, because we basically groomed him and taught him how to get his own apartment complexes and stuff like that. So, so he literally is like a lot of his tax liabilities making the same money, but he's paying like a, a fraction of the taxes he made before. And it's just like mind blowing. I spent a lot of time during that year reminding him, it's like, no, 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 you no longer pay 50% taxes it, with, with you take state and federal and all this kind of uh, uh, together. You're no longer taking 45% taxes. You're now in the 20% range or something like that. And he's like, first he wouldn't get it, but then, but then over time he understood it very quickly. I mean, he would get it of course, intellectually, but deep inside it would only took a while for him to really internalize this. Like, oh my God, oh my God. For 25 years, I've been basically paying through my nose when there's so many different ways. I, we see that, that 
a lot when people are coming and they're we call them straddling, right? So they're they're still working their W two job and they're running their land business. So I'll use that as the example. But so and people always say, you know, it, your goal I assume is to leave your W two job, and they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. But I gotta wait till I replace my income. And I was like, well, if you're making let's say a hundred thousand dollars in your W two job, that doesn't mean your land business has to generate a hundred thousand dollars for you to leave it. It's going to be quite a bit less than that. And when we work those numbers, it's really funny to see how close people are when they think they're like three years away from ever being able to quit their job. And they look and they're like, oh, I'm one more good deal away from quitting my job. It's amazing when you look at the after-tax numbers. Wonderful. And obviously, you are the CPA of a lot of our accountants, for a lot of our, stu of our land students. Uh, and uh, I always love when you, when you tell me that uh, what your staff tells you about our land students. And is, uh, are you allowed to repeat that? Uh, well, basically, <laughs> I guess this will sound a little patronizing, but it's true. It's like, I said, and we've worked with, and this will probably get me in trouble, Jack, but uh, so we've worked with other people that do some real estate training as well, a few. And we've seen them come from even ones that we don't officially work with, they still find us and they come to us. And yeah, no, what they tell me is, so Jax is like the only one that, Dex is the only one that has successful people really. I mean, uh, probably only one is a little exaggeration, but the land business as Jack teaches, it works. Some of these others, yeah, they spend a lot of money, but the results. And, and, and then there's nothing against the people that teach this. The facts are in the house flipping world, there's a load of competition. And I don't want to use bad words here, but you know what kind of a load starts with an S. A uh, load of competition out there. So even go-getters out there are struggling. We had, to, we had a few weeks ago, we had a live event in Tampa, Florida. And uh, there was front row, there was a guy sitting that had spent $15,000 in marketing for, uh, for a house deal. He has paid for the education for everything. He spent $15,000 uh, in, in marketing for a house deal and he got zero for this. Now he went, came over to us, he got our course, and he spent a fraction on that. He spent something like five, what was that, that $5,000 or less, $3,000 or so, and I think he sent something like $6,000 6, letters. It cost like $3,500. So he spent $3,500 plus minus on letters, and he walked away. He, within, four, within 90 days, he had 40, 40 deals under contract. And this is just the difference. So it's not even dinging other people. It's just that... Teaching the, the, the house flipping world, really one out of a hundred students are going to be successful. In our land flipping world, I mean, the success rate is off the charts. Like in our mentoring, 90 plus percent of our students having success. The other 10 that don't have success is because they don't do what we tell them, no matter how hard we tell them what to do. And, uh, but it's, it's literally, it's like off the charts how, how successful it is. So it's, it's, it's the method more than it's not the people. I, I think the people you work with, if I know them, they're, they're good, honest. Oh yeah, no, they're not. People. It's just the technique behind the scenes. If it's just, if it doesn't work well, it doesn't work well. If it's, if it's hard, if there's a bunch of competition with thousands of people working in it, it's hard to get a deal. But I love what you said because that's where your staff comes to you and tell you is like, what's going on? Jack's people are successful. So it yeah. didn't come from me. Came from Warren. It, did. so, and it um, didn't even come from me. It came from my staff behind me. Uh, yeah. Just their, their casual observation. Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's, I love that. So with that, thank you very much, Warren. Just a couple of quick questions and we wrap it up. Uh, question number one, it's almost like a quick fire round of questions. Uh, what is your favorite book uh, right now that you're reading I or that you read already? Uh, What's goodness. your favorite book of all times? My favorite book of all time, it, because it changed my whole life and it has nothing to do with business. Uh, and uh, my wife will tell you, uh, Tim Ferriss's Not 4-Hour Workweek, which is an awesome book, but his book, The 4-Hour Body, it started me on a whole health kick. I don't follow what he teaches in that book anymore because it's a starting place. But yeah, since reading that book, I've lost 80 pounds. It hasn't been overnight, but my whole life has changed from that. Uh, my wife will tell you I have a man crush on Tim Ferriss, but uh, anyway, that book would have That's to be all right. Good. That works. 80 pounds. Congratulations. That's no easy feat. Uh, secondly, what book are you reading right now that you'll enjoy? What book right now? Right now I'm reading the tax code. Uh, so, okay. Yeah. No, well, I've spent, we've, we've spent the last three, five months. There, there's just a 
so much new material on the tax law. I've been just, yeah, I've not been having fun. I've just been, okay. actually it's that fine. is. Sometimes if it's tax season, which is right now, you gotta, you gotta put books at aside and do what you need to do for the benefit of your clients, right? Uh, what's your favorite app on your phone? My favorite app on the phone uh, goes along with the books is right now it's Audible. I love my Audible. I, Audible, I'm right there with you. And every time when I drive off, drop off my daughter in school, which is like half an hour drive because she goes in downtown Phoenix to one of the best schools in town. I drive back home. I turn immediately the moment I get back in the car after dropping off, I, I turn on Audible and I use that time as a educational time. Uh, favorite vacation spot for you? Favorite vacation spot? Well, as long as it's warm uh, and sand's involved. I had, you know, our last vacation we took, uh, we went with some really good friends and it was just such a blast. It was very short, but we were in the Dominican Republic and that was just. Awesome. That, that very good. Amazing. Sand, sand and sun. That's, that's good. There's a, that gives you some options. Uh, do you have any hobbies other than tax code reading? Uh, yeah, I love, I, I, I'm an, I'm an avid hiker. I love hiking. That's where, and I take, that's where I use my audible so much is, you know, I know you're supposed to be out enjoying nature and listening, but after a while, it, especially there's some monotonous parts of the long trail that uh, that's where my audible comes into place. But that's kind of my personal meditation time when I'm just walking in the mountains locally. That's, you know, some people sit and chant or whatever you do for meditation. Me, it's just walk up into my mountain. That's beautiful. And you live right next to one. So uh, with that, uh, we're done. Now, Warren, people are probably going to be interested in how do we get a hold of you? And you might not be able to read what's on your cap. <laughs> Tell us, how do people find you? Uh, how do they get in contact with you, both social media and perhaps off social media? Right. Uh, uh, TACPAs.com is our, is our website. You can go to our website. I like our Facebook page. It's Tarl Accounting's Facebook page. Uh, TACPAs, I don't know how you do Facebook slash whatever. I could I can send that to you guys, and if you want to, if you have program notes, or whatever, we can put it there. But uh, yeah, we'll put it in the show notes. We'll put them underneath there, so you guys can have access uh, right. to that. But yeah, come to our please, please come like my Facebook page. We try to do we do some live, we do Facebook live. I try to not make it boring. It's not all tax. It's Sometimes just me. Right? And Warren is actually a very funny guy. So we really, we pay him good friends. And obviously he's an excellent tax expert. So wonderful. So Facebook, uh, tar, let's, again, what is it? Uh, Terrell tar, tar Accounting. Yes. Terrell Accounting. And Terrell is spelled T-A-R-Y-L-E. Yes. So make sure you have the T-A-R. But we put the links below there uh, into the show notes on iTunes, into the description on YouTube. Uh, so with that, um, thank you very much, Warren. That was a great session. And you guys see the importance of having a good partner, a good teammate uh, uh, in your, on your team. It, you can't run business alone. You run business alone. And even, even like highly successful people sometimes use the wrong law for a tax, a tax accounting firm. So, so make sure you, you surround yourself with a team that is, uh, that is good, that includes a very good and creative and, uh, uh, and smart CPA um, and with that, thank you very much, Warren. Thanks, Jack. Look forward to seeing you soon. Enjoyed this episode? Then make sure you like, subscribe, and post your comments and questions below the video. We're looking forward to hearing from you.